I'm Dr. Mario Livio. I'm an astrophysicist and author of uh, seven popular science books, uh, the most recent of which is uh, called uh, Galileo and the Science Deniers. Uh, I live in Baltimore and I currently am in Baltimore uh, at my home. Uh, as you can see, I imagine in front of uh, uh, some shelves with books. Uh, actually, I have something that looks like that in every room in the house. So uh, it almost doesn't matter where I film this. Um, so the book, as I said, is called uh, Galileo and the Science Deniers. Um, this is a fresh biography of Galileo, uh, but at the same time, uh, with an eye on science denial uh, today, which unfortunately we have quite a bit of. So the idea is to study from this uh, fascinating person um, who lived uh, in the 17th century, uh, but to see what lessons we can learn from that uh, or, you know, to what extent uh, he, in some sense, uh, already fought some battles that we have to fight again today. So, you know, when people hear that I wrote a book about Galileo, a natural question is uh, how come I decided to write a book about Galileo, given that there are already quite a few biographies of Galileo. Um, and there were several reasons for this, uh, and they were all important at some level. One is that uh, I'm an astrophysicist. Galileo is considered by many to be one of the founders of modern astronomy and astrophysics. I was always completely fascinated by this person and, of course, uh, you know, was familiar with him, but not with all the details, and I wanted to write about it. Uh, the second thing is that, uh, you know, searching through the literature, I uh, discovered that actually very few, if any, uh, of the existing biographies were written by active researchers in the field of astrophysics. Uh, more often, they were written by science historians, uh, science writers and so on. So I thought that, you know, maybe I can bring a certain new perspective to his discoveries and especially put, to put them in the context of what we know today. Um, the other thing is that the scholarly uh, written biographies of Galileo, uh, which some of which are fantastic, uh, usually are very, very detailed um, and they are not so appropriate actually for uh, just a regular reader who wants to, you know, read something uh, simpler. And so I decided to write a somewhat shorter book, but tried nevertheless to stay as accurate as I could. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, uh, I was struck by the fact that we are encountering uh, science denial today on many fronts, uh, you know, be it uh, climate change or even the initial response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and of course, uh, Galileo is famous for fighting for intellectual freedom and against science denial. So for all of these reasons, I decided that this is a book that I really want to write. Now, of course, the, 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 there is a difference between science denial at Galileo's time and the science denial today. Um, his battle was mostly, I mean, it's sometimes described as a clash between science and religion. It wasn't, and he never saw it as such. Uh, what he was fighting against was a clash between science and literal interpretations of the biblical text. I mean, he basically argued that the Bible was not written as a science book. Uh, you know, he borrowed words from... Uh, uh, Cardinal Cesare Baronio, who said, uh, you know, scripture tells us how to go to heaven and not how the heavens go. Um, so it was this type of clash. Today, the reasons for science denial are different. Usually they have to do with political conservatism, although occasionally they also go into religion. But, you know, for example, in the case of climate change, it definitely has to do with conservatism, with economic issues, sometimes with political, pure political issues, you know, that have to do with being in an election year and things like that. So the causes are somewhat different, but the effect at the end is somewhat similar. 
Galileo, by the way, was uh, not only in terms of the time in which he lived, uh, you know, he lived in late Renaissance, but he was uh, largely a Renaissance person. Um, he, he got uh, an education in the liberal, what we would call today the liberal arts. Uh, he studied the drawing and actually used that knowledge uh, in his, uh, when he did his wash drawings of uh, the moon, as he saw it through his telescope. Um, he gave two lectures when he was 24 years old about Dante's Inferno. Uh, so he knew, he knew the great Italian poets, Dante, Ariosto. Uh, he didn't like so much Tasso, but you know, he wrote about that. Um, he even wrote an essay comparing uh, sculpture and painting, uh, and some painters were his personal friends. So he really uh, was very, very well versed in, in areas other than science. Of course, in science, uh, he, he brought about breakthroughs, in, especially in astronomy, but also in mechanics. Galileo was... Uh, no doubt a fighter for intellectual freedom. And he wrote about that. Uh, and, you know, was, this was very, very close to his heart. And, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, ingenuity and creativity, you really cannot have those if you don't have intellectual freedom. Now, in terms of himself being, uh, you know, showing ingenuity, he, he was fantastic at that. For example, he wanted to study free fall. So, you know, he could drop objects and see them fall. But there were no good time measurements at the time because there were no good clocks. So he had to find a way to somehow dilute gravity, if you like, so that the times would be a bit longer, the times of fall. And he had this clever idea of instead of dropping balls like this, to actually make them roll down inclined planes. And by taking the angle of the inclined plane to be small, you know, the motion was much slower and he was able to measure times much better. Now, you know, over the years, of course, his name has inspired a lot of American ingenuity and ingenuity in general. Just, I mentioned two things. Uh, a famous spacecraft was named Galileo, uh, which visited Jupiter because Galileo observed Jupiter, discovered its four moons. Um, well, Jupiter has many more moons, but he discovered the first four. Um, that uh, spacecraft uh, was launched in 1989, was called Galileo, uh, reached Jupiter and its moons, uh, observed other things as well along the way, two asteroids along the way and so on. Um, Astronaut uh, David Scott, uh, who was on the moon, um, did the famous experiment where he dropped uh, a hammer and a feather uh, from uh, on, on the moon to show that they fall at the same rate, which is something, again, that Galileo uh, was the first to discover and, uh, and write about. We, we see how, how, you know, he's name even, and of course the work he did, uh, uh, ingenuity today and uh, a lot of creativity. I mean, David Scott started the experiment by saying that the reason we are here today is because of some gentleman named Galileo. One other thing in which uh, Galileo showed uh, ingenuity and uh, in, in any case, uh, very, very creative thinking was in the fact that he declared that the universe was written in the language of mathematics. Uh, today, we take that for granted uh, because, you know, all the laws of physics, for example, are written as mathematical equations. But at his time, there really were no such laws of physics. In fact, he wrote the very first few of those. Uh, and yet, he had this incredible intuition that somehow the, the universe has to be written in the language of mathematics. And of course, people after him, you know, picked up on that, in particular, Isaac Newton in his, you know, theory of gravitation and in writing his laws of mechanics, uh, picked up on that idea. And of course, today, we, we all do that. I mean, 
when we want to write a theory in physics or in any fundamental science, it is written in the language of mathematics. But he really was the first to somehow feel this by, by some incredible intuition of his. Galileo was a very complex personality. He had a very complex personality. I mean, um, I don't want anybody to get uh, the impression that he was the nicest person. Uh, he could be nice and supportive to members of his own family, but when it came to uh, you know people who objected to him in science or, or otherwise, he had an extraordinarily sharp tongue and an even sharper pen. Um, and he was uh, really could be very very strong. I mean, he his sarcasm was was almost unparalleled. He wrote in a very witty way. Uh, you know, in one one case, he mocked somebody who uh, told this story about uh, the ancient Babylonians cooking eggs by whirling them on slings like this. Um, and he said, oh, yeah, that's an interesting story, you know, but uh, we also have slings and uh, we have strong people who can whirl the, the eggs and we have eggs and yet they don't cook. Um, so what is it that we lack that the Babylonians had? And he said, well, the only thing we seem to lack is being Babylonian. So it must be that the eggs are cooking because they are Babylonians who are whirling them. So this type of thing, uh, I wanted to convey this personality of, of Galileo that, you know, not the nicest person, a genius, um, intellectual freedom, extremely important to him. At the same time, a lot of self-righteousness. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, he, he was very, very feisty even when he was wrong. And he was wrong. You know, a good number of times he was wrong. He, he was not always right. But this is part of the thing that we have to learn today, too. You see, scientists are actually the first to admit that science is only provisional and as good as the data that exist at a certain time. Uh, so, but the good thing about science is that it self-corrects. Sometimes the self-correction happens fast. Sometimes you have to wait decades or even centuries for it to self-correct, but it does self-correct. And this we have to understand. Science is the best guide that we can have at the time, for example, now of pandemic. There is no other way than to follow the science. Or if you look at climate change, you have to follow what the scientists are telling us. Uh, because, you know, that's the best guide that we can have on this. To bet against the judgment of science at the time when human life or even the entire evolution of the biosphere of the earth is at stake is just unconscionable. We have to follow the science. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope you will enjoy the book uh, Galileo and the Science Deniers. Uh, this is a book about a great person uh, with uh, important lessons, I believe, for today, and I hope that uh, we will learn from his example, even though the person himself, uh, you know, had his own flaws like we all do. Thank you all very much.